fundamentally, people do business with people. They don't do business with ideas, products, plans, money. They actually do business with people. So until you learn how to get the people part right, you're going to be somewhat limited in how far you can succeed. Texas Global, sparking innovative thoughts. Sodika, hello, and welcome to another episode of Texas Global Podcast. You're with me, Chao Rat Yong Jirano in our pupay, the uh, or one of the uh, global content editors at Texas Media. And uh, today we're going to talk about relationships. It's really hard, whether it's with your family, your friends, and most importantly, within your organization. How can you build strong relationships? How can you move forward with efficiency and a sense of unity within your organization? Today, we are very lucky indeed to be joined with someone who has been in the forefront of uh, innovating, uh, you know, new ideas and building new relationships. She is the co-founder and head of faculty at Leaders in Tech. Uh, CEO at Carol Robin LLC and a former director of the Arbuckle Leadership Fellows Program uh, at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I needed to get that right. Anyways, uh, let's welcome her to our podcast. Hello, hello, Carol. Hello, and thank you so much for having me on. I'm I'm so excited to have a chance to share my work with your audience. Yeah, I'm really excited too. And and by the way, I just wanted to say your name right, Dr. Carol Robin. Um, we are here to to learn about you and and your work in supporting leadership for the past 35 years. That's a quite a long time, and I'm sure you have great insight. Tell us about yourself. Well, so I am not a career academic, even though my longest career was almost two decades at Stanford Business School. I spent uh, my first, so I've had about four, five different careers, and I spent 10 years in sales and marketing and eventually became uh, a senior manager there. Then I spent some years in organization development and consulting and executive coaching, and eventually I ended up at Stanford uh, teaching leadership, essentially. Um, and I taught one of the most uh, popular signature classes at the school for decades called Interpersonal Dynamics, also known as Touchy Feely by the students. <laughs> uh, I also taught. Uh, I also taught high performance leadership. I taught, uh, and I developed this uh, leadership fellows program, which was uh, which became another signature of the of the school. And then I left in 2017 and started my own nonprofit called Leaders in Tech. I co-founded that with two others, and we essentially bring everything I once taught at Stanford to Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Wow, um, what a great journey. And I think that uh, definitely uh, there's a lot to be learned in terms of, as you mentioned, you're not just like an academic, you have experience, um, what really goes uh, on within an organization. And that touchy-feely thing is is definitely very important because we're all humans. Um, and so you, you're well known now for your book, uh, Connect, Building Exceptional Relationships with Family, Friends, and Colleagues. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so uh, delighted to. So the book is based on the lessons of touchy-feely, of the interpersonal dynamics course. Um, and it came to be because everybody deserves an opportunity to learn these valuable lessons. You know, thousands of students for decades have said this course alone was worth the price of tuition. Mm. And it seemed to David, my co-author and me, that it was not right or fair that the only people who got to learn this were those that were lucky enough and privileged enough to get into the Stanford Business School. Mm. So we wrote the book with the uh, intention of bringing this knowledge to many, many, we hope hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of more people. It's really hard, isn't it, to, to put feelings, let alone, you know, uh, points or, or tips on, on how to deal with feelings and, and others on paper. Um, <laughs> how, how it's is hard that? to do it in any medium. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, 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 yeah, how, 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 how Carol? How 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 is that? I mean, you've had experience. I mean, um, that's one of the, that's the primary 
um, challenge for all organizations. Um, how are you able to, to do that? Well, for starters, the reason this course exists in a business school, in one of the most elite business schools in the world, is that the school and the students understand that fundamentally people do business with people. They don't do business with ideas, products, plans, money. They actually do business with people. So until you learn how to get the people part right, you're going to be somewhat limited in how far you can succeed, uh, how much you can succeed in, in any setting, but especially in business. Um, so uh, what, what most people don't understand, and one of the things they learn in the course, and that our participants now in Leaders in Tech learn, and that we hope people who avail themselves of the book will learn, is that relationships exist on a continuum. At one end of the continuum, we have contact and no connection. Those are your thousands of Facebook friends. Um, we also have a lot of dysfunction. Mm. At the other end of the continuum is what David and I came to call exceptional. But the important thing to note, in addition to how do you get from this end to this end, is that along the way, even if you don't look for exceptional, if that's not what you want, you should at least know how to get to robust and functional. Every relationship can get there. And you know, it's it's I don't think it's practical or even necessary to think about turning every relationship into exceptional. But wow, wouldn't you like to be armed with the tools to turn every relationship into at least functional and robust? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I want to. I, I you know, <laughs> it, it, uh, so with that in mind, obviously, there are very big challenges into yes. building that level of exceptional relationships. Um, I, I know we have a limited amount of time. <laughs> you, I mean, you've been teaching this for a long period of time. So, I mean, if you could narrow it down a bit to what the essential biggest challenges in terms of building exceptional relationships, uh, what are some of them that, you know, perhaps you could share with us today? Well, the first challenge is that people are not equipped with the tools and competencies they need to move along the continuum. That's the first challenge. They just don't know how. And we can get into what some of those are. Uh, they, they, first, they don't understand the continuum exists. Second, they don't know, understand how to move along the continuum. Third, uh, a lot of people just don't think it's even possible. They, they look at some people and they're like, oh, I could never, I could never have a good relationship with you. One of yes. the most remarkable <laughs> things that happen yes. yeah. in our classes, this applies both at Stanford and in my leaders in tech, is that on the first day, people are like, oh my God, I can't believe that guy's in my group. I'm, I, blech, why is he? And they end up being incredibly close. So first you have to allow for the possibility that if you actually invest some time and energy, it may be possible to connect with almost Anybody. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm saying I like many how you're more. saying that. Yeah, I like yeah. how you're saying that it's almost right, right. because it's yeah. it's never going to be always. Yeah. But many more than you think are possible. And we often close it off before we've ever even really explored whether it's possible. So that's another another challenge. And the and the last one is that it takes time and energy and investment and commitment. It doesn't just happen with a flick of a switch. And people, you know, aren't willing to, you know, invest enough. And then, of course, they get what they believed they would get, which is not a very <laughs> robust and satisfying relationship. So it doesn't just happen. You know, it, it, it's, it's so hard in terms of, of, of being friends. And, and actually, I don't know, from my observation, like, um, finding true friends or finding that exceptional relationship takes a lot of time and effort. Um, I just wanted to follow up on it. Like uh, in nowadays with social media platforms yes. and, and yes. how things are kind of just getting less, I mean, we're all connected, but then less connected in a way um, oh, yes. nowadays. Um, how, how is it possible? I mean, is where do you start in terms yes. of, um, trying to connect with another person authentically, sin sincerely, um, does it have to start with you in terms of kind of like just focusing 
It's an excellent question. So let's start with how do you move along the continuum? What are some, what are some of the skills and competencies? The first one is a willingness to allow yourself to be a little more known, mm. which meet, which requires some disclosure. Not everything, not TMI, but a little bit of disclosure, which means that you have to step outside your comfort zone at least a little bit. And when you do, other people tend to reciprocate by stepping a little bit outside their comfort zone. So mm. you get to know me a little bit better. I get to know you a little bit better. And then our comfort zone with each other gets a little bit bigger. And then we step outside that a little bit more. And that's how relationships start to unfold and develop. Uh, so that's that. those are two of the elements of moving along the continuum. I feel more known by you and you feel more known by me. Third, as we start to experiment with that, we start to trust each other more. So mm. that's another component, more trust. The mm. fourth con component is that we're willing to be honest with each other, which means if you do something that upsets me, I don't sit on it. I don't not say anything. I don't just get madder. I learn to say it in ways that are productive and in service of our relationship. Mm -hmm. Fourth is that we learn, how, uh, the fifth is we learn how to resolve conflict productively. And the last one is that we're committed to each other's learning and growth. And when you learn how to do those six things, uh, you move along the continuum to at least functional. And you're right that a lot of leaders especially say, oh my God, that takes so much time. And what I say is, well, there's first of all, nothing more efficient than the truth. So are you better off letting people make up stories about you and mm -hmm. what you're doing and why you're doing it? Or are you better off telling them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, you've probably worked with the loads of, of leaders. Um, what major characteristics would you say are, are good leadership? Yeah, I, I love that question. First of all, good leaders are good learners. They have what is known as a growth mindset. That term was coined by Carol Dweck highly recommend her book. Um, and it's the, it's the idea that what you don't know is just an opportunity to learn. That if you don't know how to do something, she adds this fabulous magical word yet. I don't know how yet. Mm. Yeah, it completely changes the meaning. Yeah. I've never done that yet. I've never seen that happen yet. So a growth mindset is the first. And the second one is, Good leaders understand a source of power that, that we call it referent power, meaning that leaders have lots of different sources of power. But this one in particular, referent power, is the kind of power you gain when other people see you as a referent figure, somebody they admire, somebody they want to be more like, somebody for whom you're a role model. And, and to the extent that you're a referent, figure and people are drawn and influenced by you because you are, they will, they are more likely to follow you. Um, I mean, how, just follow up, how, how do you get over the fear? I mean, a lot of us are fearful of new experiences, the unknown. Um, yes. How, yes. how do you, it's easy Easily said than done. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> right? I mean, some, once yeah. you jump, you make that jump, it's like, oh, what was I thinking of? Right? But it's yes. just that 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 portion, I think, is a, a lot of, it's a, it's a big struggle for a lot of people. Absolutely. And we actually talk about this quite a bit in our book, because you're right. Fear often holds us back. Uh, it holds us back from learning. It certainly holds us back from exploring. And it holds us back from taking risks. And you don't build stronger relationships without taking some risk. But the way to manage the fear and the risk is what we call the 15% rule. This goes back to what I was just talking about with regard to incremental risks. Think about three concentric circles. The circle in the middle is your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You don't think twice about what you say. Yeah. The circle on the outside is your danger zone. In a million years, you would never share that or give that feedback to somebody. But in the middle is what we call the learning zone. But you don't learn anything new unless you step outside the comfort zone, but you have to stay inside the danger zone or you freak yourself or the other person out. Mm -hmm. So when we used to tell students that, and to this day, when I tell all my leaders in tech, 
CEOs and founders that they say, yeah, but how do I know the minute I step outside my comfort zone that I'm not in my danger zone? Yeah. So we say, think of the 15% rule, 15%. Step a little bit outside your comfort zone. If you step only a little, you'll know it. You'll feel it in your body. Yeah. You'll feel a little uncertain, but but you'll still be well within the learning zone. And when you do that, you're unlikely to freak yourself or the other person out. And then if things go well, you get to redraw your comfort zone with that person. And then you can step 15% beyond that. And by the way, every relationship has its own dynamic with regard to what 15% looks like with you between you and me might be different than what 15% looks like between my co-founder and me. Mm. Mm. But but if we want to learn and grow, we have to step outside our comfort zone, which means we have to take a little, some risk, but, you know, risk with, just like in any business, you got to take some risk, but you're not going to take stupid risks mm. and you're going to wait and see what happens. Yeah. I like that, that 15%. I mean, I think that makes it less scary. <laughs> exactly, um, exactly. Yeah. And also like you get to you get to kind of test the waters a little bit, right? So a, a yeah. little bit like you dip your pool, your toe in the pool instead of jumping in and finding out the water is freezing. Yeah. And then getting traumatized. <laughs> yes, exactly. Never going um, to pool again. <laughs> okay. Classic question. The ideal structure as to how to, you know, enable good interpersonal relations, there, you know. Yeah. There's all sorts of different structures. How how yeah. do you in from your in, insight and your perspective? How how what is the ideal? As I'm sure you you just said just a minute ago, nothing is always the same. You can't right, you know right. it's the, nobody so can play by the same steps. Good because what we're talking about is shifting probabilities, mm. right? Nothing is ever going to work perfectly. Nothing is ever going to be you know always perfect. But here's what moves what moves the probability of it being much stronger. And one of them is you build a culture and an environment where people tell the truth. There's nothing more efficient than the truth. Mm. But most people are very afraid <laughs> to yeah. tell the truth. <laughs> and that's how they get in a lot of interpersonal trouble. So one of the things that our students learn is how to build, for example, feedback rich environments. Because if we're going to be committed to each other's growth, and we're going to be honest and tell each other the truth, and we're committed to each other's learning, uh, then we have to learn how to actually give feedback in ways that are that builds and deepens relationship instead of harms it. And that is a big skill. Most people don't know how to do it well, even if they've taken feedback training classes. Um, that's a big portion of the course. It's a big portion of the book. Mm. Um, do you see a difference in how relations are built in, in different areas of the world? Um, yes. from obviously, uh, there are differences, but what are the main things that we should be you know, aware of now at, at yeah. the status quo? Yeah. So there's a reason the students call the course touchy feely emphasis on the feely, not the touchy. And that's because the role of emotions in developing stronger relationships, in giving good feedback is critical. So emotions are universal. All people feel emotions. And the basic emotions are, are emotions that all people feel. What is very different from cult one culture to the next are what we call display rules. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you communicate a feeling? How do you display a feeling? What's okay, not okay? Um, what are the norms that, that dictate which feelings in which settings are more and less acceptable? Um, what's different from one culture to the next is even what, how people define conflict. One of my favorite things that used to happen in the class is that I used to show a little video of a team having a you know, having a disagreement. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask my students, okay, how many of you think on a scale from one to five, eh, this is a minor disagreement. All the Israelis would raise their hand. <laughs> and then I would say, okay, how many of you think, oh my God, this is about to just explode and be a huge problem. 
all the Asian students would raise their hand. (laughs) So, so in fact, (laughs) that's something to consider (laughs) and understand there are, but all the lessons are adaptable. They just need to be adapted to different cultures. And in the end, all of these students, regardless of where they come from Mm -hmm. uh, and what their cultural background is, learn the power of the tools they get to move along that continuum. Mm. Um, Then perhaps maybe for our listeners to get a um, more sense of how it can be implemented, can you share some case studies of how leaders have been able to to overcome the, the challenges that we've mentioned? Sure. Well, here's one. I'll give you a great one. So one of our uh, participants and leaders in tech, one of the things that that people learn when they when and they'll people learn this from the book if they buy it, is that there are different obviously there are different feelings, and some feelings are connecting and some feelings are distancing. Anger is a very distancing feeling. Mm-hmm. Hurt and fear is a connecting are connecting feelings. Almost mm-hmm. always anger is a secondary feeling. If you're feeling angry, chances are that what's really going on is that you're afraid or you're, you're afraid, scared, or hurt. Mm-hmm. But because so many people have been socialized not to express feelings, and especially in the West, it's like anger, especially for men, somehow seems to be an okay thing to express, uh, then everything is anger. So one of my one of my participants um, wrote to me not long ago and said, I just had a remarkable experience. My team had, 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 had a big miss of a huge milestone, which he found out about on a Friday at the end of the day, and it was gonna impact their customers very badly. And so he spent the whole weekend just stewing and mad. He had an all hands that was going to happen on Monday. And he spent all weekend thinking about, you know, how he was going to just blast them. Mm -hmm. And then he said, then I remembered what you had taught us about anger being a secondary emotion. And I thought, what am I really feeling? I'm feeling scared that I'm the only person who is as worried about this Mm -hmm. as I am. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling worried that everybody else doesn't understand the magnitude of this issue. So Mm -hmm. on Monday morning, he came in, and this is a great example of both being disclosing, allowing yourself to be known, and connecting. And he said, so Friday night, I went home. I was ready to fire half of you. I was incredibly disappointed. I was really pissed. And then I remembered this thing that I learned. And so actually... I want you to know that underneath my anger was worry and concern. And I, you know, I don't know if, if I feel badly for our clients, I don't know if anybody feels as badly as I do. And let me tell you, and he said, I have never seen my entire team rally around a problem that quickly. Fixed it in two days. Mm -hmm. And that's because he made himself vulnerable. He was willing to talk about his feelings. And he used what he'd learned to rally the troops. What do leaders need to do? They need to inspire and they need to motivate and they need to influence. And if they hold themselves apart from everyone else, they create more and more power differences. And then other people don't feel obligated to help them out. Do you feel that perhaps some leaders are scared of of showing that kind of feeling? Oh, absolutely. Because they feel that maybe... People may not respect them. Yes, absolutely. And by the way, that's one of the things that that all the participants in Leaders in Tech and in the students learn, which mm-hmm. is the our beliefs sometimes need to be updated. So they're based sometimes on old data or on something someone told us that we never tested. And so unless... You and that's the power of the course, by the way, and 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 the and the programs that we do, which is people come in with what we call mental models, beliefs, and assumptions about what makes them effective, and then they find out that actually, no, they're actually it's those beliefs and assumptions are actually making them less effective. I don't know if we have time, but I've got a quick anecdote for you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We we always have time. A personal example. 
So in 1975, I went to work for the largest industrial automation company in the world as the first female hired into a non-clerical job. And what I learned very quickly was, wow, I better leave my feelings in the parking lot. There are There is no place for feelings here. And it served me really well. People, you know, people, t- if, I'd, if I'd gotten all emotional, nobody would have taken me seriously, probably. But here's what happened. 10 years later, I'd gotten promoted multiple times. I was now running a $50 million business. And I was at an offsite with my team, which was still all men. I finally fixed that, but not at the moment of, <laughs> of the story. I'm sitting there with six men and I get excited about something. And I'm not, you know, they're not responding. And I'm like, come on, you guys, this could be really cool. Nothing. Finally, I'm like, what is wrong with you all? God, why don't you see this potential? And one of them leaned in and said, Carol, is that like water in the corner of your eye? Oh my God, are you going to cry? But then he said, are you human after all? Oh, are you human after all? And then I tore up our agenda. And I said, and we spent the next two days of our offsite talking about who we were, why we were there, what we needed from each other. And that was the day I became a leader. And I believe that's the day we became a team. So guess what? You can overdo and not test something that served you really well earlier in your career and long ago stopped serving you. Mm, mm, I excellent, excellent. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um with with that in mind, um, times have changed. You know, we've had the pandemic affecting the way we work. We we're kind of now slowly going back to the office, uh, but definitely the dynamics of relationships have yeah. changed. Um, how how is it now? Do you think you know? Because during the pandemic, I talked to a lot of experts about how how can we connect um, through digitally, but now. It's a bit different. We're changed. Definitely, you cannot uh, change the fact that um, Zoom meetings or similar types of meetings are going to be a part of our, the way that we work in the future. Right. Um, how has everything changed, do you think, from the pandemic? Well, one of the things that's happened as a result of moving to so much uh, non, so much virtual communication is that we have now foregrounded task and backgrounded relationship. I mean, it's hard enough uh, to be on Zoom all day and exhausting enough. And so you just wanna get the work done. But guess what? Eventually, everybody pays for the backgrounding of the relationship more and more, and the focus only on task, which means, A, you have to double down on all the stuff I'm talking about, and you have to create structures that allow people to have the kind of interactions that I'm talking about. So here's another example. One of the things that we do in leaders in tech is when we all meet, uh, we meet in small groups. And the first thing we do is we start our meetings with each person taking 90 seconds to say, to complete the phrase, if you really knew me right now, you would know that. And they have to use at least three feeling words. And when they finish saying what they've said, everyone else has to say, or there's a minute for others to say, when I heard you say, and then complete that prompt. So if you really knew me right now, you would know that even though it's 8.30 at night in San Francisco, and I am so jazzed to be having an opportunity to share this with your audience, that that's more than keeping me awake. If you really knew me, you would know that I have been so disappointed over and over by how hard it has been to get the word out about this work to the world, that there have been times where I've just wondered why I am spending all, why I spent four years of my life writing a book, why I'm why I keep trying so hard. And if you really knew me, you'd know that I try to balance my hopelessness with some optimism, and uh, sometimes that makes me feel better. Okay, you oh just got goodness. to know me a whole lot better, didn't you? Oh my goodness, Dr. Carol. <laughs> I'm like Terry. <laughs> and that took I'm less. just like, I just, yeah, I, I just and, wanted, yeah, yeah. Now yeah. imagine what happens. Mm. Now you could now you could respond with when I heard you say, and then you know, 
tell me, but you just did sort of. Uh, yeah, I was, I, just, I was moved. Yeah. I was moved. I was moved. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I really and, appreciated yeah. it. I, I, I really appreciate your your honesty, and it's just exactly what you said from the first question that I asked you about being truthful, about you know being sincere, and right. it's really hard to do but that nowadays. See, yeah. But you see, remember I talked about referent power. Showing up that way increases your referent power. People are drawn and more influenced by you when you're willing to be authentic, appropriately authentic, uh, and uh, and willing to speak, you know, honestly and vulnerably. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that what 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 the leaders in tech fellows have now done is they've adopted that practice with their leadership teams. So even though they're on Zoom, they spend the first 10 minutes of their Zoom meeting with each person saying, if you really knew me right now, you would know that. And that's the way they've maintained the strong relationships. And in some cases, they've never met in person. And they say they have never felt closer to their fellow uh, team members because you know, they've got leaders who say, who think, oh, this is important. I better pay attention to this. And yeah, we only have an hour and a half, but I'm going to take 15 minutes or whatever so that everybody can do if you really knew me. Wow. If you really knew me now, Dr. Carol, I am yes. so happy that, you know, at you know 10 a.m. in the morning here in Thailand, I'm able to actually sit and talk to you today. I mean... I don't know for the leader for 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 the readers or or the um the listeners right now what you're feeling but for me honestly you have impacted my life honestly I we have very little time and I I don't want to make this podcast too long because the fact is that you know you've hit all the points that we really need to know and you are going to be joining us via you know virtually at our Texas Global Summit 2022. It is yes. going to be the first time that we are on site here in Bangkok. We are so excited to be able to host it. And we are so excited now to know that you are going to be a part of it. If you want to know more for our listeners, you know, more about Dr. Carol, uh, more about her book and, you know, we can't cover it in half an hour, but we sure can learn more about it at our summit. Please uh, go to our website, Texas, uh, and and fig- find out how you can get tickets. And, and uh, of course, Dr. Carol, how c- can our listeners find out about you as well? So go to www.connectandrelate, all one word. Your autocorrect will try to make it three different words, connectandrelate.com, <laughs> where you'll find a bunch of podcast, a lot of stuff under media, other podcast talks, et cetera. You'll also find some free downloadable self-assessments, guides to how to learn this. Um, and if you do buy the book, then you'll find that at the end of every chapter, there's a deepen your learning section that essentially takes you through things you can do with what you just learned with people in your life, just like the students do. And the second chapter of the book is called A World-Class Course, One Chapter at a Time. Oh my goodness. I'm so happy to have you with us today. As an awkward, socially awkward person, I'm so happy (laughs) to be with you. And we can't wait to hear from you more from our summit. And that's it for our podcast today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Carol. And until next time, see you and take care. Bye bye. Texas, sparking innovative thoughts.